This is episode 230 of the Wildlife Photography Podcast. In this episode, Q&A. Hey everybody, my name is Jerry, I am from WildEye. Every 10 episodes of the podcast is a Q&A, and this week, what I decided, or for this episode at least, what I decided, instead of asking online and I'm having people send in questions, I spoke to the office, and I said to the guys in the office, listen, send me some questions that I can answer on the podcast and just ask whatever. So it's a tough one in the office because it, we're a travel industry and everybody's not always here, so people are all over the show, and the people who were in the office and the ones that had time send me a few questions that, um, that I'm going to work through now. So the people that send in some of the questions, I just printed them out now before I started this, is uh, Andrew Danquitz, um, who's this, Judy, Laura, and Yuhan. So I'm just going to go from the top and answer these things. It's more fun. Some of them are a bit more serious. I just had a read through now. It's interesting. I might have to think about it. But uh, here we go. Q&A from the Wilder office starting now. So the first couple are all from Andrew Danquitz. I'm going to just read them from the top and answer as we go, yeah? If you had one place to travel to only for the rest of your life, what would it be? Now, if you've been listening to me for a while in the podcast and you're consuming my content, I am, I would, I would say in love with, but I'm completely awestruck by Svalbard each time I go there. For the rest of my life, that will be an interesting one because, I mean, magic as the place is, possibly still, eh? Because the one thing I still want to do one day is go for a whole year and watch the seasons change. Because remember, in this place, the sun is up for three months and is down for three months, completely dark. And then you've got this beautiful light in between. So I think Svalbard does come to mind. If it's for photography, um, I might have to choose something different. I'm talking purely photography because the diversity there is less from a biomass point of view, but more photographically. If I'm looking for more biomass, it would probably, probably have to be somewhere in Africa. But for the rest of my life, that's really tough. I mean, that's a long haul. Right now, and maybe I'm still in a bit of an Arctic aftershock, if you will, um, but I'm, I'm probably going to peg Svalbard at the top of that. Um, if not, it would probably be a place like Turkey, which to me was, I mean, I only scratched the surface, but the diversity in that place, I think, would keep me busy for a very long time if I could go back for the rest of my life. So, tough one, but I think Svalbard for me, from a photographic and natural history point of view, there's just something that speaks to me at soul level, and I think Turkey as a, as just a travel destination. Ask me this again tomorrow, it's probably a different answer, yeah? Next one, if there was one camera body and one lens you had to use for the rest of your life, what would it be? Okay, so if we're talking about today's technology, to me it's an easy answer. The first lens would be the Olympus uh, 40 to 150, which is equivalent to 80 to 300 2.8. Super diverse. Uh, I've done portraits with it, close-ups. You can stitch to create almost a landscape idea. And then it's got the 300. Um, if, if I had to choose another brand, Nikon or Canon, I'd probably go for a 70 to 200 as well. That's always my first kind of focal range. I find it works quite well. Um, camera would be tough because... For the rest of my life, technology is going to jump. If we assume, Andrew, technology is going to stop right now, I would probably, I mean, the EM1 Mark II I'm shooting now is great. It's small, so for the rest of my life, I want it to carry, especially if I get old, um, much weight. But um, probably go for something top of the range right now, technology-wise, so that I can grow with it, if that's a thing. But the focal range for me is the important one. I think 80 to 300, 2.8 as the Olympus, or in any other brand, 70 to 200. That is, people ask what lens should, I, I spoke to Brendan, um, a client, friend of mine, who was in Svalbard, and he asked about lenses, should he buy a 70 to 200 with a converter, or an 80 to 400? I just find that the 70 to 200 offers so much more. Um, so yeah, that kind of range. Camera, right now, probably EM1 Mark II, or one of the Sony's, mirrorless ones. Size, compact, easy. Right, moving on. More of Andrew Danquist's questions. What is hands down the worst workout movement in the world? Worst workout movement in the world. Um, burpees suck. I'm trying to think, what else? 
Um, I'm not a cardio fan. I know I'm, I'm paying more attention to cardiovascular exercise because I'm getting older and I need to do that. But burpees, even though I'm short, I have a low center of gravity, burpees suck. So I'm going to stick with that. Um, what is Dwayne Johnson's favorite color? Andrew obviously had nothing to do in the office. Um, I don't know. I mean, if I look at the, the, the clothing he puts out, the Under Armour Rangers he put out, um, probably in the darker sides, like navies, blacks, blues, I would guess. I've got some of the earphones, um, his Under Armour earphones, which is like a camo color, but I would have to go and Google that. <laughs> uh, does gear in photography matter and to what extent? Okay, interesting one, because I still think, and I've said this for a very long time, I still 100% truly believe that the majority of photographers get stuck on their gear. They don't worry about the creativity. They don't worry about the narrative. So yes, gear does matter only as far as it will allow you to execute the vision that you have. So the gear is just a tool for you to do something with. So yes, it matters. You have to have a camera before you can create something, right? We agree on that. But... If you focus so heavily, let me put it to you this way. If you want to put a nail into the wall, you're going to use a hammer, right? Do you really worry what hammer it is? Do you have to use the H4 3000Z or just a normal hammer from the... It's okay. It's a tool that does something, okay? It's a tool that does something. Certain specialized tasks, if we stick to the DYI kind of analogy, would require more specialized equipment. You can get away without it, but if you want to do the job really well, you would need specialized equipment. So the, the, the question of does it matter and to what extent will have to start from what is your creative vision? What is your goal that you want to create? And then work backwards and see if I want to do a hell of a lot of very low light shooting. That's my goal. I want to do creative low light photography. Then you would obviously you would choose a camera then that will allow you to do that. So yes, it does matter, but it is not the point of the exercise. Photography is not about who has the best camera. It just isn't. Photography is about who can create the nicest images, and again, it's not a competition thing, with the gear that they have. Chase Jarvis's tagline from Creative Live way back of um, the best camera is the one that you have with you. It's cliche, and everybody's throwing it around, but it's, it, it's a fact. I would rather be in Svalbard with a Canon 70D and a 70 to 300 f5.6 um, if I'm there rather than have the best camera and I'm sitting at home. So yes, gear does matter, but only if you're executing your creative potential against it. I hope that makes sense. All right, moving down, Andrew's questions. Da, da, da. At what point do you draw the line in editing an image? So. Historically, and, and look, if we speak from a wildlife photography point of view, the goal is and should always be, I believe, if you say you're a wildlife photographer, not a wildlife photographic artist, because that's different. David Yarrow, for example, phenomenal visuals, but that's not just photography. There's other stuff involved as well. So to me, if I want to show you, my, my, I want to show you in my images that if you sat next to me, Right? If you sat next to me when I photographed that lion, leopard, polar bear, whatever, that is what you would have seen. I, me, and I would recommend this to most wildlife photographers, would recommend try and keep it as natural as possible. The moment in wildlife photography someone looks at your image, right, and they say, oh, I think, not even I see he has increased the saturation a bit, I think he's increased the saturation. The moment people's mind wanders away from what you're trying to show and tell them, I think you've gone too far. So on Instagram, for example, if you want to see heavily overly oversaturated and over sharpened images, just scroll through Instagram for a little bit. You'll find them all over the place because people think that with processing, more is more. No, less is more in photography and in both in composition and in the post-processing side of it. So for me, for wildlife photography, I try and keep it as natural as possible. When I'm doing prints and I'm creating fine art, for lack of a better term, prints, I, um, there I have more freedom because now I'm taking my creative vision that I'm going to show you and say, look what I have created. I sound like Tom Hanks from Castaway. Fire, look what I've... No, anyway, 
Um, so then I say, this is what I've done. The same thing is when you start getting to places like panning, you've changed time. You have warped the perception of time in a visual. So then I would say then you can probably go more saturated or heavier on the clarity slide or whatever the case might be. But for wildlife photography, I draw the line that I want it to look natural. I don't want anybody to say, ooh, I think he brushed the eyes or he pumped the clouds. I don't want to pump the clouds. I don't want to draw the eyes. I want to process as fast as possible and show you as natural as possible version of what I saw. Um, now, side, side link to that, when you get to things like landscape photography, I believe there we need to process a little bit more because if we go and stand, and I'm, I'm going to start sending out PDFs for my new Iceland photographic workshop that I'm doing, um, if you stand on a mountain and you photograph off something, right, you're shooting normally tripod-based, time-lapse, longer shots to get the smoky water or the smear of the clouds. So in my mind, and you guys must email me if I'm wrong, in, in landscape photography, I would probably process it a bit heavier. Uh, not heavier, not in a bad way, just more. I've got a couple of images from Vic Falls where I've pushed the boundaries, to me, I mean, I'm very conservative from a processing point of view, but where I've kind of pushed the boundaries creative-wise, and I love what I see. So... If you're doing street photography, you can go grunge. You can add a style or a kind of a look to it. But because this is wildlife, I try and do it as natural as possible. Because if you come with me and you look at my galleries on my website, that's what you would have seen. Right. Landscape, I think. Um, and look, when I get closer to the Iceland trip, I'm doing some homework and research and stuff, we'll discuss this in more detail. But I really think wildlife natural landscape can be pushed a little bit to create those amazing visuals. I do think so. I'm not talking necessarily adding and removing stuff. I'm just talking the richness of the saturation and the deepness of the contrast. Those are the kind of things I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, Dankwitz, last question. <laughs> What's your heaviest clean and jerk? Uh, not that it's... <laughs> anyway, 135 kilograms, which I think, I haven't got my phone here, I think it's about 300 pounds or something. A couple of years ago, I did get a 120 kilograms in training a little while ago after not training for a long time. So I'll probably be able to pull a 130. Goal, more importantly, of what you've done is what you want to do. I want to hit a 140 at some stage. So uh, that's the goal. Right. Thank you, Andrew. Some very enlightening questions there. Uh, next one's from Judy. So Judy runs our list of logistics and operations. So her questions already come from that side of it. Luggage, she says. What size bag is acceptable? What type of bag can it have wheels? Now, this is very different for different destinations. So for example, if we're going to Botswana, we have to keep in mind that they have very strict luggage rules on the small planes, right? So there, we get around that, just as a side note, we get around that by buying extra luggage seats, which you have to really do. Um, big hard cases, the kind you can hide a body in, bad, right? That's just bad, not gonna work. Um, the best kind, I think, if I can blanket this whole thing, is to get something like North Face have them, Patagonia have them, and I think Thule have them. It's basically a duffel bag with two wheels at the bottom. So it's a hardcore thing that can take the knocks of going into small planes, and it also has a pull-out handle. So you get a waterproof one. So for me right now, that would be the way to go. It's a duffel bag with wheels. Um, Size-wise, obviously, and yes, I understand you want to bring all your outfits on safari. It's really not necessary. I'm not going to dress up. You don't have to. Um, but the smaller it's going to be, think about the ease of travel. Like mirrorless photography, small camera, easy travel. Same with luggage. Um, find out if the place has where you're going to. Find out if it has laundry and wash twice during the week. So for me, best option, duffel bag with wheels, pull out, waterproof, because sometimes you're outside, sometimes your luggage is outside. Um, so North Face and I know Patagonia, probably some of the best ones in that range. Camera bag, can I have a hard pelican case or must it also be a soft-sided bag? Judy's question. So what I see some people do, especially if they're traveling long haul with big gear, they would have a pelican case, the, the hard case, into which they then put their, their full camera bag, they lock it, and that then they check in, each to his own. Not a fan, but hey. Um, <laughs> and then when they get to the, the wherever they're going, Pelican bag stays aside and they use their camera bag and then reverse it on the way back. 
you're not going to, put it this way, a Pelican case on a trip is going to be very cumbersome. So you want a camera bag that's got easy access. So even in the vehicle, wherever you're going, on the Zodiac, on a vehicle, wherever you are, you want to be able to zip, open, work. Yeah, the Pelican case and packing, it's great for travel, but I would still recommend just a good solid camera bag. We're currently using F-Stop. I've still got a Click Elite from way back, but hey, there's, there's many great brands out there. Um, Judy asks, weight restrictions, especially for the Mara. So what we've done is, if you look at the on script, you travel on your own, right? Your luggage limit is gonna be limited by the airline, so 20 or 23 kilograms, 50 pounds, whatever for your check-in luggage. I'm still baffled by airlines who say that seven pounds, or seven kilograms, sorry, is your allowed luggage um, to carry on. Now I know BA, British Airways, has a thing that your luggage, you can take any amount, really, of carry-on luggage, as long as you yourself can put it in the overhead compartment and it fits in there. So that's all cool, check with your local airlines, I've got many thoughts on this, but for a different time. When you get to the Mara though, the flight from Nairobi, Wilson Airport, into the Masai Mara, to Serena Airstrip, where we go to, is normally limited, I think, to like something like 35 kilograms per person, which is all your luggage. What we do though, is because we run the trips, we charter a plane for all of our guests, so we do pay um, for what's called a luggage seat, or a cargo seat, so we can load extra. Don't take the piss and bring everything, because <laughs> that's just not gonna work, but, yeah, so a, a normal bag, 18 to 20, 22 kilograms for your luggage, and whatever camera gear you need to bring, we will be able to get to the Mara for you, because that's the important thing. Um, interesting one here on gratuities. Must I tip daily, or at the end of the safari, and how much? Now this is always, I mean, I come from a lodge background, so I've managed high-end lodges, and the gratuity and tip thing's always a weird one, and for some people, very uncomfortable. So. I've been at lodges where after the first game drive, you come back and people are like, oh, thanks, I'll give you $10. It's like, what are you doing? And then they, they want to tip you off to every drive. No. If you want to, and again, I'm going to put this out there as a 100% upfront, gratuities are never expected, but always appreciated, right? Lodge staff get paid. We, you kind of, it's almost a given that they're going to get grats, but if they don't, they feel like, eh, you're an idiot. No, I'm joking. Maybe. But then they move on, right? So... If you're at any lodge, on a ship, um, a, whatever, you can leave your gratuities for the guide at the, or the driver or the lodge staff or whatever it is at the end of the trip, right? So when you get to the end and you hug and you cry because you're so sad that you're leaving, then you can leave the gratuity at the airstrip if it's your guide or at the lodge when it's one of the lodge staff, chef, whatever. Um, how much is very difficult? Uh, it differs according to the lodge, the place, the country, the currency, it's so difficult. So for our Mara camp right now, we're doing, I think, between 15 and $30 per day per person as a recommended. So if you stay there for six days, you want to give 30 it's $180 for the week, that goes into the staff and they share it out. Um, the, the number for Svalbard, for example, I'm just taking the other extreme, is very similar. 25, I think it's 20 euros or $25 a day. I would then normally compile all of that for the guests and we hand it over as bulk to the, the ship staff and so on. But it's very trip specific. Ballpark, if you work somewhere between a 15, 20 per day for the lodge staff, you, you're probably in the ballpark. But if and when you book a trip with us, ask your guide, ask me if I'm taking you or ask one of my guys who's taking you and they'll be able to advise what that kind of guidelines are. Um, best thing you can do is be open about it and ask, really is. Um, what's Judy got your last question from her? Visas, Kenya. Can I get them upon entry or should I do them online? You can see Judy's in full logistics mode. I can see you. Um, so for Kenya, you can get them when you get there. Whatever current, whatever um, country you're from, you can arrive, say Jumbo, because that means hello in Kenyan, in Swahili, and then they can, you can do it there. I think it's $50 for most countries, like US, UK. You can get it on the spot. Um, if you're from a South African country, you can just go and they just stamp you. So you can get it upon entry. I, and then let me, before I say that, you can also get it online, e-visa. Now I've stood in those lines and I've watched the e-visa counter. People take out and say, oh look, here's my paper. I've bought, got this, I've paid for it online. It sometimes takes even longer for them to process that than to just take your money and stamp you. So depending on 
if you're arriving with me, like if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm hosting you through the trip, I would be there and I would say, let's just do it there. If you feel unsure and you don't wanna have issues on the moment, do it online. But you can do either, and both are pretty simple. Right, Judy's questions. Um, next up, what do we have here, Laura? I was literally about to start filming this and recording this, and then uh, Laura's email popped up, so I went to print hers quickly, so I haven't really looked through this. My question, sorry, hope they are not too late. Okay, you are very rarely upset in the public eye. Tell me what it is that really makes you upset, why it makes you upset, and how you handle the situation. My goodness, Laura. Um, where's Andrew Dankers with his <laughs> questions about training? Mm. Okay, I'm not very, really upset in the public eye, yes. I've always been, I've always been someone who, I like competition, I've grown up in that way, and with a gymnastics background is, you get used to, I think this is a good thing for life, you get used to kind of, things are not always gonna go your way, you can't just lose your shit and expect to be better. So, I like to have control, and now this is a funny thing, because people who know me, I like to have control of me and what I can do. The stuff around me, I actually like chaos. I like everything happening. Like, I put a quote out this morning on my, on my Instagram, something like, the, the trick is to bite off more than you can chew and then chew it. I love that, because you just get stuck in and get shit done and move forward. But the thing that really makes me upset, and I, I, I'm, I'm babbling now because I'm actually thinking, is I think unfairness in the world, rudeness, and especially unnecessary, is there, there's not a necessary type of rudeness, so unnecessary rudeness, that it can get me from the, the most incredible high of happiness, if I see someone being unfair to someone else, I wanna lose my shit. Because, I don't know where this is going, but the world is too messed up right now for us all to be rude and unfair to each other. I really think that if, if I can stop one person from not being on the receiving end of rudeness or unfairness, I think I've made the world a better place. So that makes me excessively upset. Um, the other thing, look, I'm just thinking as well, the other thing that really, really, really gets me going is cruelty to animals. I'm talking dogs and pets and dog fights and shit. That makes me kind of see red and I don't like myself when I get to that point. Um, why it makes me upset, what, or sorry, what I do to handle the situation. I mean, a lot of the times in that situation, if it's unfairness or rudeness, like for example, let's take a, 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 a restaurant. You go to a restaurant, the waiter brings you something, there's something wrong with the food, and you, uh, not me, the, the person shits all over the waiter and they just fucking keep going on and on, and it's like, dude, it's not his fault. He didn't do that on purpose. It's not necessary to act like that. Now, I can walk up and do that, right? Or, which could potentially increase a situation to something it shouldn't be or doesn't have to be. So a lot of the times it's not possible for me to do that. I have in the past say, listen, dude, come on, man, just that's not necessary, but it always ends badly. So I think what I do in my own way when unfairness and rudeness and just not being nice happens is I overcompensate to the other side. Like I go overly nice or overly, just, and it's just like we're talking about travel, is people get to passport control and these poor people sit there for six, seven hour shifts, they do the same shit day in, day out, and then they are just doing their job in a lot of the occasions and then people give them this mouthful of attitude. I always lead with kindness and niceness. It's the right thing to do, and it just feels good, and you're gonna get more from people. Just an example on this. Um, we went for dinner a couple of, like a week ago, right? At Rockamama's Burger Joint, like a designer burger joint. And we were sitting inside having a, a beer and a burger and whatever, and there was two people sitting outside, and you could just look at them and see, you know, you're idiots. They, better than everybody, they horrible to the waiter, they're just that kind, right? And anyway, so for some reason we watch the waiter, who's also our waiter, go outside, he gave him the bill, he fetches the bill, he comes back, and we watch him, and he's just like at the little stand, and we watch him, he takes the bill out, looks at it, checks the cash, check it again, they left him zero gratuity, and this was a nice guy. And he ate up so much shit from those horrible people, and they, they left him nothing, talking about gratuities now as well. 
So I'm like, fuck man, that's not cool. That's just, that's just not cool. You have to, if, you ever, if you're a waiter and I'm ever your, your client at a restaurant, you have to really, really fuck up badly for me not to leave you a gratuity. That's just what it is. I think it's the right thing to do. Anyway, so when our waiter came, you could see this guy was like down because he ate shit from them for the whole afternoon and they left him nothing. So, so I left probably about a, on our bill, about a 60% gratuity. And when I gave it to him, because it was cash, I gave it to him in cash, walked away and he stopped me and said, sorry, sorry, no, this is too much. I said, dude, it's fine. We saw what happened. It's cool. This guy almost got a tear to his face. Now that to me is overcompensating so that in my own way, I can take rudeness and just kindness and, in, and, and flip it. Because that, Laura, gets me upset, is unnecessary rudeness. And I mean, and it goes all the way to bullying and all that, but just rudeness and not being nice to people. It's just so unnecessary. Other than that, not many things really get me upset. I think I get it from my dad. He's so chill. I mean, there's, I mean, I can throw all kinds of quotes at you of, yo, if you can't do anything about it, don't worry about it, blah, 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 blah. If you're not going to worry about it in five years from now, don't worry about it for five minutes. I'm just lucky that my DNA likes chaos and I counterpunch in life. So for me, that works. But rudeness, can't do it, eh? Anyway, let's move on from that one. Um, as someone who has been to many, many places and countries, which is your favorite and which would you most likely uh, go back to and why? Similar to Dan Chris's question from earlier. Um, slightly different. So I think Turkey to me last year was probably one of my highlights ever because it was also my first proper vacation in eight years. It was two, two, two weeks of vacation, which since we started Wild Eye, we, we did, didn't do. So that was special. And I think with that, it kind of clouds your judgment as to how special it is. But that said, Cappadocia, um, Bodrum to Istanbul blew my mind on every level. Love it. Now, I, am, I was born to travel. It's in my DNA. I can do this. But Turkey stood out. Um, Svalbard, as you know, from a photographic and kind of a, a destination point of view. However, I mean... If I were to ever live in another country, it would probably be the US. Um, I've started exploring a bit more landscape photography opportunities there for future, future trips. And we are looking down the line to open an office there as well. So, so yes, I think right now, Laura, to answer your question, right now, I would probably want to go back to Turkey of the places I've been to. Um, but it's always difficult. I think if you had to say to me, here's the document, right? Sign this now. You can only go to this place ever. I'd have to think more of it because then you're kind of locked in. But for now, I think, yeah, probably I'm going to stick to Turkey for now. It was bloody amazing. Um, last one. Is there one experience that sticks out about all the others? The one thing that you went, wow, what the? And then there's all kinds of emoji things just happened here. Please tell us about that. As I was reading this now, the first one that came to mind was... Last year with Joni and Sawi Sands, where we had that sighting, some of you saw it, if you've been following around or listening for a while, where waterhole, nine lions, buffalo, lions attack, get baby buffalo into water, buffalo chase them into water, stand off for an hour, lions fight in the water. That was insane. Um, I get, I, I had that this year in Svalbard as well, where we had this one particular bear, because the previous year on Svalbard, we had one next level photographic sighting but it's one of my my personal favorites polar bear on the ridge dark clouds behind just stunning and this year when we found this one bear and for two hours we were alone with him my my two zodiacs and my guests only us with this bear and every once in a while i would sit there and think this is just insane and i would after like 15 minutes i said to these people okay guys this is not normal normally it doesn't do this so for a long time then we <laughs> Polar bears, that sighting was great. Um, you know what? And I'm going to mention this in the next episode, which I've recorded already. The one thing I'm going to record a standalone podcast on not too long from now, probably next week, is one on gratitude. And I think initially, when you start doing this, everything's new all the time. And you'll hear, I speak to Andrew Dankwitz as an interview in the next episode. But I'm at a point where and please don't get me wrong, I'm not being blasé about anything here. I've been lucky and privileged enough in my life to travel to a lot of places. I've seen some next level cool stuff, um, experiences that made me laugh and cry and be scared and everything in between. But 
what I'm trying to do now, because if I don't do this, I think I'm going to lose interest, is if I get to a sighting. Now, there's, there's sleeping lion sightings and there's hunting lion sightings. Very different. But overall, is every single time that I get to share an incredible natural history moment with my guests is to inject gratitude and to literally put my camera down. And the people on my Svalbard trip now must have, been think, must have thought I'm crazy because this bear was coming, doing all kinds of stuff, walking up, sliding down, drinking water, sorry, not looking at the water, breaking off icicles, putting a reindeer carcass apart, crazy sighting. And halfway through, I said, listen guys, put your camera down and just watch. Look at me like, what? But for me, I'm doing more of that. I put my camera down and I remind myself, I force myself to consider how lucky I am to do what I do, right? So um, that for me is a big deal because you have to have gratitude and I never take anything for granted. And I think the more I do this, what I do, the more the more gratitude I show and feel and go after because then the thing of what thing stands out, the experience, the whole thing stands out. So maybe waffling down a bit of a rabbit hole here, but really I'm gonna do a podcast on this because I feel strongly about this, where people who are hosting trips would just go there for just the tiger and I just wanna get a tiger portrait and then you ignore everything else. There's so much beauty that, are you not grateful to just be there? And look, it's a mindset thing and I understand but, yeah, I think gratitude. But, Laura, to give you a proper answer, uh, probably the, the lion hunt from last year was just, it was Nat Geo stuff. And the polar bear sighting from this year, um, yeah, God, there's so many. I must actually do one, maybe top 10 amazing sightings in the past because there really is many. Great question. Laura, awesome questions. Great food for thought. Thank you. Okay, uh, last one here is from Johan. So Johan was, just a bit of context, Johan I spoke to in one of the previous episodes about cheetahs on cars, which if you missed it, cheetah, cheetahs should not be on cars. There's the summary. Um, he was after Marlon, our uh, next guide. So he's one of our older employees, been here for about, God, about four or five years. So Johan asks, having seen wild eye grow the past seven years, where do you see wild eye seven years from now and what excites you most about the future? This is something that we think about and talk about very often. We have, at the beginning of each year, we have a strat session with all, all the staff, everybody's there, and everybody gives their own vision. Now, from the first day, let me put it to you this way, when, when Jono and I started this thing, and then Andrew came on board, we, when the three of us started this, we sat at Nkuru, the lodge I, I managed at the time, right? And we sat down and we kind of, Got the idea, we knew what we wanted to do, kind of bring sexy back to photographic safaris and kind of the fun and take the intimidation away and the whole thing. And we, we, we kind of, on a paper, big chart thing, we must actually, I think it's here somewhere. We, we graphed out our first four years, or sorry, first phases of what we would like to do, right? And we, we kind of worked on a 20 year plan for the company. We hit the fourth phase like in the third year. So since then, we've kind of just been going all in. And that quote I mentioned earlier on, um, bite off more than you can chew and chew it, that's exactly it. And I think that's also the mindset with which we're gonna go forward here. I mean, I, when I came back from Svalbard, I walked into the office here, I can't show you guys now, but it's over there. For those of you watching on IGTV and on YouTube. Um, I walked back in here and everybody was in the office. I think only one of the guys was out. And I sat at my corner desk, and I looked at this and I thought, holy hell, what have we created here? Because in the old days, it was the three of us. We've scaled this now to 15 people here. We've got our own camp in the Masai Mara. So the last seven, eight years have been insane. The reason that I don't want to give a definitive answer to the question of where do I see it in seven years is I don't want to put a self-imposed barrier on how big we can take this thing. That might sound like, a, like a, I'm wimping out on the, on the answer, but I literally think that we are just getting going. And we, John and Andrew and myself spoke about this outside here the other day, is we have only now created the platform to legitimately and realistically 
challenge the, 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 the goals we had initially. Look, the last six, seven years have been fucking amazing. It's just been amazing. But now we're in the position. I mean, we just look now, we've got 10 different safaris offerings in Kenya. Initially, we only did like two in South Africa. Now, international trips, I've got Iceland, which is going out today, Svalbard, Patagonia, Pantanal, India. I'm looking at Yellowstone next year. So there's all of these things which is now happening. I don't want to say to myself, because I don't operate like that, that this is where I see it in seven years. I can promise you one thing, Johan, and for you guys as well, we're only getting started. Um, we're only getting started. The one thing that we do, um, that we are kind of looking at, a uh, bit of a restructure in the company, just from a back end, you guys won't have to worry about that, but also then to get more of a presence internationally, i.e. office in the US, I'm still going after that down the line. So I reckon seven years from now, that will be something that's there, but it won't change the DNA of what we're trying to do and the reason we started this. Uh, I actually, just to wrap up, I had an interesting chat with Andrew this morning where he also said that we're dealing with, we're dealing with kind of big operators, right? And in the beginning, it was just the two of us and Jono kind of doing our thing. And you were like, hi, oh, sorry, can I get the rates and this, that, the other. Mm. And now it's at a point where they're saying, oh, thanks, we didn't pick that up. But because we are so entrenched in getting shit done, we're not worrying really about that. I think if you worry too much about where it's going, and again, I'm not copying out, you need, you need a vision, and that we have. We wanna change the way we see the world. Not just our guest, because our logo, change the way you see the world, it's for us as well. And if I think what we had on the table when we started this, to what we've done so far, the people's lives we've affected, that's real, man. That's real. But I mean, if I look at all the people we have and stuff, so it's, it's been a hell of a ride and we're only just beginning. So, Johan, ask me that in seven years when we're much older and much wiser. We can talk about it then. Anyway, guys, that's it. That's the Q&A from the office. I will do this once in a while as well. I also want to do 250s on the horizon, episode 250. And I want to try and get some of the guys in again. But we're almost at our Mara season. I'm off to Kenya next week, 29th of June. I'm heading up to Kenya with Jono, Adele, Erin, and Catherine. And it's the first week of our camp being open, right? So we're gonna go up and basically double check. This thing, I've got to install a new Wi-Fi system. There's a new water filtration system that we have to install. So a lot of cool stuff happening. But from then on, I'm only seeing all the guys in the office again, I shit you not, in December because of the travel schedule. You must see the diaries, it's mad, 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 mad. So um, yeah, I wanna try and get the guys around. I did think of this now. This is the first solo podcast I've done in a couple because it's been a lot of interviews, but I dig it. So with that said, episode 231, the one that's after this, is an interview, a chat more, catching up with Andrew Danquist. The first episode I did with him was episode 158, in which he was gonna join us. We knew it, he knew it, nobody else knew it. So I did a podcast interview with him, but kind of, we couldn't say his name, which was a fun one. So this is the first time I sat with him and it was really, really nice because I wanted to talk about how he's found the change from lodge life to city life. How's the change from guiding permanently in one place to guiding all over the world? And we went down literally every single rabbit hole we could find and it's awesome, really cool chat. So make sure you hit up the next one as well, episode 231. But for now, I'm gonna wrap this up. It's Friday in the office. I've got a quick Skype shit. I've got a Skype now, now. And um, then I'm gonna get this one live and out. Guys, as always, thank you so much for the time. Talking about gratitude, I don't just say this. I truly mean it. Thank you for every message, for every view, for every listen. It really means the world to me because I know there's so much stuff out there to listen to and watch that it means the world that you lend me your time. So thank you for that. If you have any questions, that I can answer for you. If you think you've got an amazing question, send it through. I've got some time now, and in Kenya, I'm gonna be doing a lot of podcasting that I can do as a standalone episode. Jerry at wildeye.co.za, that's the email address. G-E-R-R-Y at wildeye, two words with a hyphen in between, .co.za, or hit me up on any of the social media platforms, Jerry Van Vault. I love hearing from you. And then in episode 240, we'll get back to some of your questions as well. As always, have a fantastic day. My name is Jerry, I'm from Wild Eye. See you next time. Goodbye.